I look around and I say, you guys are looking younger. Every time I come here, you look younger. It's good. Just a, one of the popular themes we're seeing around the world today is that there's, everyone believes that their culture is the right culture. So we've got wars all over the place where all people are trying to do is implement what they believe, their value system, the things they choose in their life, the way their life runs, the legal system. They believe that that's right. That's why they do it. And when they see someone who's doing it a bit different than theirs or threatens their culture, they want to interrupt it somehow. If they've got a military ability, then they'll go to war with them and they'll try and impose their culture on someone else's culture. But these culture wars have gone on for a long time and the culture wars aren't only limited to political battles. We see there's a culture war between rich and poor, between the educated and the non-educated, between males and females, between the young and the old. We see these battles are happening all over the place and they're not leading our world to a better place. In fact, if we look around, we probably see in this country, this country is more divided now than it's ever been in its history. And it's not going to improve. And the world's no better than that either. We see everywhere we go, there's this trouble and trouble. So I'd like to talk about God's culture because God's culture doesn't change. The culture of this world, this, we don't even know what's going to be legal tomorrow. They can change anything. They can alter this. We've got people who used to be a boy yesterday and are a girl today. Tomorrow they're going to be a puppy dog. Who would know what they're going to do? You choose your gender, you choose your belief, you choose this. You... I just sit there, I watch, this is not a political statement, but I watch the um, would-be su Supreme Court appointee. This lady was asked a question and she was asked to give her definition of what a woman is. She said, I'm not a biologist. She has to rule on the differences between the legal system, men's rights, women's rights, and all the things which are constituted by law. She couldn't even define what a woman was. And I think, where are we going to when the people who rule over us cannot even work out their own culture? They have to keep reinventing it. So we, I thought we'd have a look at God's culture. But why? Because God's culture is consistent. The salvation message that God preached through Jesus Christ, as opposed to what religion is jumbled up, and of course there's thousands of religious cultures around the world too, all varying one from another. But there is a consistent culture in the scripture. And when Jesus Christ was asked how, how the church would be formed, he made a list of signs that would follow believers. He said, this is how you can work out those who have got my culture. I'm using other words, but they're saying exactly the same thing, just simply for clarity of uh, purpose today. How are you going to identify those who are walking in God's culture? He said, these signs will follow them that believe. And he listed a variety of miracles which would identify people who were of God. Now, not one of those signs he identified was that they prayed a lot or they read a lot or any of those things. They were actually all outward manifestations of miracles which God was doing in them personally. And it became a personal culture for everyone. The term we use is to be born again. And when you're born again, you're born into a new culture run by a different set of rules and, and balances. And this culture that we enter into, we call it salvation, born again, new life. There's a whole series of words. But ultimately, it's just God's way of giving the human race the life that they could have had and should have had right from the beginning. But because human government, human rule is totally corrupted God's system, he needs to do it another way. And that's exactly what happened. So 2,000 years ago, approximately, when uh, the day of Pentecost came, people who were gathered in prayer received the Holy Spirit. And for the first time in Bible and historic reference, people began to speak in this language that God gave them. And this language was a pure language. As described in the Bible, it was a supernatural language. It was a, a language which dealt with issues which we couldn't deal with. And there's a whole lot of descriptions of the benefits of it, which I won't cover. But the point was, this was the beginning of a culture. Now, a lot of people, when they come to the Lord, we know that we're asked to repent, be baptised in water, because that's what God said would work. And we're asked to receive the Holy Spirit, to pray. Now, for some of us, 
Receiving the Holy Spirit took a period of time. Some people have been a couple of years because in their heart and mind they just took a bit of time to get the sums done, to get themselves to a, what you might call a, a place of repentance which God was able to respond to. And God responds when you're in the right place in your heart, you just instantly speak in another language and that is the seal of God uh, on you that you've entered into this spiritual culture. But this is a two-part culture. God's culture is you need to enter in first to be one of the inhabitants of the city, just metaphorically speaking, in other words, one of God's people, one of the saved. But part two of the culture is that you need to walk in that spirit. So part one is relatively easy to comprehend and part two is very easy to comprehend. But part two is what has been the stumbling block for the bulk of all Bible history, no matter what your religion is, not referring to revival fellowship particularly, but all of the spirit-filled people around the world, the bulk of them have tripped up on part two of the culture because they don't know what God's culture is. They've never been told how part two works because most of the time, many of them don't even know what part one is. They can't define it. Some people see receiving the Spirit, speaking in tongues, having miracles and signs and wonders as a, a process where that's just a bonus added on top of your believing. But the Bible doesn't talk about a bonus on top of your believing. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, when they received the Spirit, they spoke in tongues. The book of Acts is a record of the actions of God working in the people through a historic period of time. How did they know they received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? They said, we heard them, we hear them speaking in tongues. Not we saw the, the dove come down from heaven like they appreciated with Jesus. They said, how do you know? And they said, well, we heard them. What does all this mean? And of course, Peter then stands up and he explains Joel's prophecy about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this is what has now happened. And they looked at each other and said, well, gee whiz, we're guilty of the death of Jesus Christ. A lot of us were very happy to see him go. And our nation, identifying within the political culture, our nation killed him. What can we do? How do we get out of this mess? And he simply said, repent, be baptised every one of you, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he said, and this cultural promise will go on, not only for the people of this time, not only for the people of the next generation, but for all those who are far off, even to the end of the age, this is how this culture will flow. So he made it clear to the people, this would be the sign. Then later on, and we move, skip through to Acts 10 and 11, a few years later, the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we know they received the Holy Spirit? How do we know that they were born again? The Gentiles, who were the enemies of Israel, they had no political or bloodline culture to identify with, and yet when they received the Holy Spirit, they too spoke in tongues. And uh, it was spoken to the people that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. In other words, we've got exactly the same cultural markers as they had. The same cultural markers that the Bible identified. The same cultural markers that when John said, when the Spirit comes, you'll hear the voice of it. And you'll hear it like the wind, the Spirit. You won't see the Spirit moving, but you'll hear the voice of the wind, the wind being synonymous with the Spirit. And he said, so it is with all of them. They would all have this sound of the wind coming out of them. And that was just another one, but this, the Bible's loaded with them. But these identified a working culture which God could do with people and they equally identified the Gentile conversion. He said, we, four, we heard them speak in tongues. Again, that was just the identifier that they were part of that culture. And it moved on. So I'd like to move into the second part of the culture. This is overcoming because this is the one that really is important for all of us being part of the spirit. Matthew 22, verse 37, you might like to turn there because this is a two-step rule. And they were trying to trip Jesus up and they asked him this question in the process of trying to trip him up. They asked him to summarise the Old Testament principles into what he was promising would be a fulfilment. Now, many of these people couldn't even answer questions themselves, so they sort of figured if they asked Jesus to answer these questions, they would surely trip him up. So they asked Jesus to summarise somewhere around 500 plus thousand words in a sentence or two. And this is how he responded to that question. 
Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That's part one. That was the summary of part one. Now, I'd like to define what the word love here means. Today, probably the catch cry of this generation in the West is it's all about love. Everything's love. Love this, love that. You've got to love your brother. God's a God of love. You know, we get this thrown all over the place. Most people don't know what the Bible means when it uses the word love. Does it mean feeling warm and fuzzy? Well, it can do. But Bible doesn't talk about love in those terms. When the Bible talks about love, God talks about servitude. God's love is actually an action. It's a verb. It's a demonstration of his belief. God doesn't think things and doesn't believe things. He's actually, he does things. When God loves you, he does the loving. He doesn't think the loving. He provides. He turns it into an action. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we love the Lord. How do we love the Lord thy God? We love the Lord with action. We don't all sit at home going, I love God. I have good feelings about God. I love his word. And we sit at home. Well, I'm sorry, that's not what it's talking about. But we know that. And this is what gets exciting because we understand something here which a lot of people never grasp. That for those who love God, they do what he asks. If you're married and you love your partner, you provide for them. That, that's what love is. Love is a provision. You can't tell your wife you love her, then never uh, do anything, never earn an income, never do any of the housework, never do any of the responsibilities. That's not love. Warm, fuzzy feelings aren't very satisfying for a period of time. You need action. So the first part he said here, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? Your heart, your soul, and with your mind. That's not three different versions of fuzzy. That's three versions of discipline and doing. And it's really good because we know under the old law we can read hundreds of pages on how they serve God and the benefits. But in this covenant we're in, we're in a culture of great blessing which has never been seen on the earth before. We're part of this new culture. So he summarised part of this understanding of what it is that would rule, the golden rule. Now, verse 38 goes on, and I guess it puts us right in a place where the clarity of what's said here is beneficial to us. It's a, a bonus to all of us to have this so clearly spelled out. He said in verse 38, this is the first and great commandment, referring to the last one. Then he goes on in verse 39 and says, likewise, along a, a similar path, the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Not you shall have warm, fuzzy feelings about the people around you, but you're actually going to do for them what God has done for you and which you do for God. Servitude. See, godly's love, God's love is a doing word. It's not a, a thinking word. It's actually a, a word of action and deeds. And it's very important. Now, there is actually a little summary to this, and I'd like to take you there. It's in Acts 20, verse 35. And this is a summary of the summary. We've just looked at the summary of the, all the Old Testament, put in two, two sentences. Now we're going to look at a, a summary of how to convert this as spirit-filled people into something we can understand and actually commit to deed. In Acts 20, verse 35, and it says here, I have showed you all things. It's interesting, not some things. I've actually revealed everything to you. And now he's going to summarise this. How that so labouring you ought to what? Support the weak. Part of our duty as a spirit-filled person, God knows that we have to work. God knows that we've got houses to care for. He knows we've got clothing that need attention. We've got to mow lawns. We've got to wash cars. He knows all that. That's not aside from all that. That's all part of life and responsibilities which he said he would bless with us anyway. But when we turn to the spiritual arena of responsibility, we see these words here, that we should support the weak and to remember the words of the lead, Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, and this is a, a golden principle, he said here, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now this concept is an eye-opener of culture definition for spirit-filled people. 
Where it says it's more blessed to give, it's not more fuzzy in the feelings. It's actually, there's more blessing comes from God to you if you're a giver rather than a taker. And this is where people fall down. There's a, a whole concept of, uh, of God's culture, the prosperity doctrine, where it's all about God, you know, getting for yourself, getting wealth, getting power, getting this, getting that. And every now and then you turn up at a meeting and chuck a couple of uh, dollars in the collection bin and you've done your duty. God's culture is not that culture. God's culture is actually the reverse of that culture. God's culture, as he said, you will receive more blessing in your life. Now, blessing just doesn't mean spiritual uh, power to you. It's also in the natural arena because when it was referred to later, the Lord said, I would that you prosper and be in good health, which is your physical welfare, your, your social status, your home life. He said, I would that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. So he linked the two together so that there would be a cultural outcome in the spirit and there would be a physical outcome in our natural lives. This revelation, if you want to call it that, it's more blessed to give to receive, means that when you give over for the Lord and you invest in what the Lord wants you to do, you're going to get far more blessing in your life than you ever would have got before. But even more than that, the blessing you get from God is greater than the blessing you would have got if you weren't doing those things. M meaning that if you applied yourself to making an income or being famous or whatever your hobby is, excelling in your hobby or your sport, God said that those who give up those pursuits and service the people that need help, he said, I will give them greater skill and greater ability than they ever would have had in the natural arena. Now that's a promise. That's a cultural promise. It's God's gift to us to be in a better position. So he starts off by giving you miracles. I spoke in tongues when I received the Holy Spirit and I guess everyone here did too. And for many of us, there was an instant healing that came from something, something else happened. We had a whole series of blessings and healings and things that just continued to flow as we walked in the Lord and it's still the same today. So this culture we enter into is a, a culture which is defined by scripture, but it's a culture which God said that many would move away from because we live in an age, particularly in the Western nations, where it's all about taking and very little about giving. It's all about what's in it for you. This is my life. Who's, no one's going to tell me what to do. Well, I'm very sorry. The governments of this world tell you what to do, whether you like it or not. That's how it is. You try and argue with the tax man and find out how it is to do your own thing and how successful you are with it. You'll, you'll uh, be done in because they, you can't defeat the government you, and you can't defeat the Lord either. So our fellowship, it's a, a blend, an uncompromising blend of God's culture and out of the world we live in we, in, we bring into the church or into our lives the world's culture which doesn't work against the Lord's culture. So we've got a lot of good things happen in this world, and I won't go through and name them all, but we, we all understand the benefit of marriage and children and those things. We have employment, we've got uh, medical assistance, we've got a whole variety of government assistances for people and so on. We have no trouble adapting those cultures, but quite often the world starts reinventing the laws of morality or the laws of ethics. And it's so corrupt these days that rather than correct the people who are doing the wrong thing, they just legalise it. And that way they're no longer doing the wrong thing. That's how stupid this world is. When everyone's stealing, oh yes, well, stealing's now legal. When everyone's driving with their hands off the steering wheel, well, of course it's legal. What do you expect? That's the type of mindset which permeates many governments because they can't deal with reality so they have to change the law. They have to change it because they don't quite often have a moral or an ethical bone in their body because they don't understand what that is. Because our culture says whatever feels good, do it. Whatever you believe is right, that's right. Whatever you think. And as I said, we look around the world today and I've never seen a sicker world. You know, you can, I get up in the morning and I say to my wife, am I a man or a woman? I did something go wrong through the night? And she said, something goes wrong every night. So, thanks for that. Anyway, so we haven't got a clue 
according to the law, what we're going to be or expected tomorrow. But under God's ethics, under God's culture, we have consistency. And that's why we fellowship. That's why we read scriptures like this to tell us what God's culture is. And for the, the spirit-filled people around the world, they always hit the wall when they let the culture they live in overrule the culture which God has asked them to walk in. And that's important to take on board. I've got um, a couple of things here. I'll just read out of... Um, I read out of Acts 35. It's more blessed to give than receive. For a moment, I'd just like to talk about our value as people in the church. What are we like? You know, like we look around, we see some people far more gifted, far more skilled than we are. We see some people who just naturally share their testimony with other people and we're quite often too nervous. We see some people just chuck a pamphlet out and someone will do this and we can't do it. Someone gets up and does their testimony and think, oh, if I had to go out in the front, I'd faint. You know, we've got people, but we've got multi-talented, multi-skilled people which all have a different role to play in the fellowship. And I'm not going to particularly go into all these roles because it's not my point. So I'd like to make a point how vital every one of us is. Now, we've got a video I'd just like to play. This is actually a marimba band, and it's out of, um, it's out of America. I'll just get you to play it. We'll listen to this for a little minute. You'll have four minutes of enjoyable music.
Yeah, that uh, marimba band. Uh, marimba is a wooden percussion instrument like a wooden xylophone, just to give you an idea. Now, they, they, they were made up of three separate high schools in New York City, uh, sorry, Washington State, uh, which is on the other side. Um, and they go around three, three mixed groups of children who have worked together and they go around just playing and doing what they do. And the point I wanted to make out of this, outside of being uniquely different and very entertaining, 14 players there, sometimes they have 18, sometimes 17. Those 14 players, every one of them comes from a different family. Some are rich, some are poor. Some are broken homes. Some are not healthy people. Some are very brilliant in their academic studies. And they're a diverse group of people. But you might have noticed the girl down the front left-hand side, her job, dunk, 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 dunk. She did it. Now, if she wasn't there, that, that music they played would have been lacking and would have been clearly lacking. In fact, every one of those people had a role to play and outside of all their natural lives and outside of all their natural circumstances, when they get together, they're in harmony. The church is the same. We've got a worldly responsibility, we've got duties, but when we come together in the work of the Lord, we're a unified team of spiritual believers who have something to offer. And this is what God presents to church before the world is a unified group of people who've got a cultural input to give them, something they can listen to, something which will change their life. Now, music in this instance was entertainment, but for us, we're giving people eternal life. We're giving them the knowledge of how to be born again. We're showing them how to have a, a sustainable life and a life that works. When you think about these people, they all have to go home to something different. Not every one of them's happy. Not all of them are, uh, are skilled. And yet every one of them made a contribution, which was remarkable. There was no, there was no errors anywhere in that whole uh, uh, music. In fact, at the start, you might not have noticed that one of the girls in the middle nearly knocked her, her um, marimba over and had to correct it and correct the, uh, the echo tubes before she started, but she started on time. And uh, you saw the gentlemen going around the uh, marimbas, all having the time of their life, sharing each other's marimba and just working in a circle, all playing sometimes two or three under one marimba. They were doing it. It was so, in my eyes, it was so synonymous of a church which is presenting the word of God and living that word and while we are doing this, it's God's harmony. The word of God is blessed in all of us. Now, bouncing off that, I'd like to take just a closing thought. I'd like to turn to um, Matthew 25, verse 41. We know scripturally that the Lord has asked us to forbear one another, to forgive one another. If everyone has a quarrel, resolve, resolve it. Don't let it continue. We're told to develop a bond of perfectness. That's not what I'm going to read now, but this is in Colossians 3.12, if you're taking notes. Just develop a bond of perfectness. So when those musicians all started playing, they had a bond of perfectness. They were there to present what they presented, and they presented it. And they did a really good job. And all the other things they do, I think there's only four recordings. You've got to sort of scour YouTube to find everything they've done. Uh, they're all excellent works, but that one was the best uh, sound and also the best video work compared to the others. So um, they're not a professional group, they're volunteers. So God has asked us to consider the harmony of what he wants. And he didn't want any of those players... I'm sure the guy who wrote the score for the marimbas, because he had to convert it over to a whole variety of differences, he didn't want someone to play their own tune or do their own thing. He needed to keep them with the common cause behind them. And the church is really no different. God has given us a common calling. Go into this world, preach the gospel, save the lost, recover uh, those who have fallen by the wayside, and bring people to a place of unity, but the place of unity is playing God's music, not playing our own. Doing what God wants, not what we want, and again, then God will bless it. Now, interestingly, and I, look, I find this very comforting because one of the greatest comforts I have in the Lord is I know what God wants me to do. I know what God wants me to do, and sometimes we think, oh, 
I don't know what my job in the church is. Yeah, can I tell you? Serve your brother. Love your brother and sister. That's your job. That's, that, that's as deep as it gets. Your ability to do this will expand with time. Your ability and wisdom to make these things work will multiply as God gives you the gifts and the talent to uh, do the work he wants. That's how simple it is. Serve the people. Now, I'd like to close on this point because it's a very important point. And I believe that so many of today's spirit-filled people, again, broadly sweeping a brush around the whole world, they don't know actually what this means. Many of them can't identify the spirit in them as being salvation. Many of them can't identify speaking in tongues as a sign of salvation. Many of them don't know that prophecy and interpretation in tongues at the time of the gifts was edifying for the whole church. They're not aware of that. They're not aware that Paul told them that they should come behind in no gift, that their whole role was to be a servant of God. Why? Because you want a good life. You want to be well catered for. You want your life to be happy. You want a good future. Then let God take care of your future. How do you do that? Yield over and be a servant of the Lord. It's as simple as that. And there's no complexity in that understanding. It's when we start trying to reinvent ourselves or reinvent the Lord, that's where the trouble comes. I'd like to read these verses. This is the parable of the sheep and the goats. The reason I'm going to read it is because it's the only parable that takes us through time and space and puts us into the immediate point of the Lord's return. And he explained things here, which again just further emphasises that the culture war we fight is against unbelief or spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, sometimes people think spiritual wickedness in high places has got to be the Pope, or that's got to be the Antichrist, or this is going to be that. Well, let me tell you, the Pope isn't in a high place. Hey, what's this? The Temple of the Holy Ghost? This is a high place. When the Spirit of God dwells in you, that is a high place. And it's spiritual wickedness in high places that is going to cause a problem. That means that spirit-filled people who don't know who they are, can't identify their calling, don't follow through with the calling that they should be, that this spiritual wickedness in high places is going to cause the downfall of so many spirit-filled people. And not only yourself, but those who listen, those who hear. And that's why he gave us such a wonderful insight to grasp this and go, I can do that. I know it. I can actually explain this. I can talk to people about this. This is so, so simple. Why? Hey, that's how our family runs. We raise our children. Yeah, there's dirty nappies from time to time. That's what God made wives for. So they could hand it to their husband. <laughs> yes, we had a rule in our house. If it was messy down below, the wife looked after it. If it was messy up above, I looked after it. So that worked well. Anyway... Let's look at Matthew 25, 41, because we've got a, a definition or an explanation which just so wonderfully fits in with the culture that God wants us to be thinking about. Now, well, I'm not going to read the whole thing. We don't have time. There's a principle here that there's two lots of spirit filled. One are called sheep, one are called goats. Some people think it's saved and unsaved. Well, let me tell you, the saved and unsaved aren't judged together when the Lord returns. It's the spirit filled who are raised to a point where this judgment's going to occur. No one else, the Old Testament saints, they're not going to be raised up in this transaction of blessing. This is spirit-filled people. Both the sheep and the goat in the Old Testament were clean animals. Both were suitable for sacrifice. Both were suitable equally for food. And both were suitable for all the religious things that were required. So no, not, we're not dealing with clean and unclean. We're actually dealing with God's people. The metaphor here quite often gets lost, but it's very clear. So he compares them. Now, goats by nature have a different behaviour than what sheep do. And I won't go and explain that. It's a whole talk in itself. But goats tend to be loners. They are herd animals, but they'll do what they want regardless. That tends to be how they are. Now, so the Lord brings this metaphor together for us to understand and he now makes a reference and said then shall he say this is verse 41 also unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels 
This is pretty heavy duty. He's now equating the fate of spirit-filled people to the same location and the same destiny of what, uh, as he said here, the devil and his angels. This is horrific. This means there's a culture failure with these people, something totally devastating which is different than the sheep who he commended. And he goes on to explain it in such a way that you can't mistake the, the meaning. There's no tricking up with words of Greek or Hebrew or origin or this. It's just simply logical delivery, and that's, that's what makes it so wonderful. He says in verse 42, For I was hungry, you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you took me not in. Naked, you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, a stranger or naked, sick or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? These are the people who love the Lord. These are the people who today walk around telling everyone how much they love Jesus and how much they love to pray and how much they love to fellowship and how much they love all these other things. But why are some rejected and some accepted? It, it's not trickery. There's no double standard here because he answers the question. And I love this because those who I, I, I walk in the Lord with, those surrounding us through our fellowships around the world, particularly in countries like uh, New Guinea, or in Fiji, or in Nepal, where you've got a, a, a different world order, a different type of culture, they're coming out of their cultures, they're doing this, and their lives are improving dramatically. We see it, we hear it, and we rejoice in it, because they pick up this fundamental truth that so many people miss. Let's read what this truth is. When we are hungry, thirsty, when do we ever ignore you, Lord? They, they were bamboozled, because in their mind... They clearly and truly believed that what they were doing was what God wanted. How could you believe that? Unless you moved away from reading your scriptures. Unless you move away from the things which the Lord wanted you to teach you. Because why? I don't want to hear that. I want to go to a church where the music makes me feel good. Well, I've given you marimbas. Do you feel good? A little bit wooden, but I've given you music. Do you feel good? But you don't feel saved, do you? No, because when you walk out of here, that feel-good's gone. And the Lord doesn't want churches which are built on making you feel good. God wants churches which actually do good. And doing good isn't building a drain in a village in Somalia. Might be helpful, but spiritually, he doesn't want that. He doesn't want you connecting up water to villages in Africa, even though that can be helpful. That is not the gospel. That is human assistance, but it's not the gospel. He is now defining what he wants from us. So when did all this happen? Verse 45, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily or truly I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not unto the least of these, you didn't do it unto me. If you don't do it and support God's children in the fellowship, God says, Well, I take that personally. I take that personally. Because you couldn't serve my people, because you couldn't set time aside to see fellowship for what it was in its entirety and its purity and its spiritual reason, because you were too busy making money or looking for the boyfriend or the girlfriend or looking for fame or fortune or maybe just plain bone lazy, because you're too busy following those other things, he said, I have nothing for you. But it's not my judgment, you chose. I told you how it worked, but you chose. You chose not to do this. Meeting after meeting after meeting, the gifts were there, the word was there, but you didn't want that, so what did you do? You went somewhere else where you get another message. You go somewhere else where you're told, God loves you, doesn't matter what you do, God loves you. That's not what God speaks about, it's not what he wants. So he goes through this on purpose to give people part two of the golden rule. This is my culture, serve one another. This is my culture, walk in the spirit. This is my culture, look after my children, care for them. That's not our whole life. Our whole life includes wife, marriage, children, whatever, or if you're not in that position, other responsibilities. God knows all this, but the culture is the servant's culture. It's the servant's culture which God blesses, and the ones who have chosen an alternative culture than that, 
He said, well, you're heading off to everlasting punishment, meaning you've made your choice. Your choice wasn't to get my blessing. Your choice was to get happiness. And this time, at the expense of my blessing, he said, I'll give it to you. You've had your happiness. And when the Lord returns, that's all you've got because you're not getting any more. But it was a reflection back on the individual. Your choice, you do it. Now, one of the, just closing thought, one of the points that I looked at in the book of um, Revelation was the end of the world and so on, and there's a whole lot of things there which are interesting, but there's a whole lot of metaphors, like you go back to Noah and the ark, you go back to Moses, all these people were serving God for the sake of the people under them. Every one of them had people whinging and sooking, every one of them had workers and diligent people, but there was a, always a win and a lose. The ones who didn't get the blessing were always the ones who didn't serve God's way. They were always the ones. The ones who did serve, they always got it. Now, when you saw those people playing the marimba, that girl, she was vital. Ding, 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 ding. And you probably saw the girl at the back having to lift the mallets and she, it was a real workout for her. In one of the other videos, she actually is down the front quite nimble. But um, that girl down the front, you might call her a one-talent person, a person who's maybe not as gifted as they could be, not as agile, not as spiritually astute, but her c contribution to that piece of music was essential or it wouldn't have happened. Your contribution and your walk in the Lord, no matter how big, rich, powerful or whatever you are spiritually, your contribution is vital for God to get his message out to the whomsoever. When uh, we went through the... T I I'm not a movie fan, but I like the Titanic. Firstly, it was true, and secondly, it's a historic timepiece. It shows you how people were. It's just sort of good just to see attitudes and things. I, I love the bit where the guy said, even God himself couldn't sink this ship. Yep. Not true. I watched that, and when they all got out... The ones who survived were so frantic. There was people in the water and they're all based on truth. Now, the interesting thing that hit me between the eyes when I was watching that is that when the people came up to the boat to get out of the water for safety, when they pulled themselves up in the boat, not one of them said, gee, this boat's full of old people. See you later. This boat, there's only teenagers here. I don't want to be in this. I want, I want people my age. I want people, what do you got to eat there? But if you could abandon the boat, if you got this, you only got one meeting a week, that's my type of boat. No, when they were in the water floundering, they were happy to get on a floating plank, let alone inside a boat. That's how we are. God's given a vessel for us and we should be thrilled that we're part of it and the offer made for us to be part of that boat, we should be thrilled. But we see today we live in a world where people are so fussy, they want this, they want that, and they're quite happy to be in something which will not survive the water. So our culture is we encourage people. We warm towards worship and fellowship. We encourage people to get to as many meetings as you can because, look, an obvious question, if you're going to serve people, how are you going to do it? If you turn up at a meeting once a fortnight, you only Sunday's the only day, and I'm moving aside from people with health issues and tyranny of distance and obvious things, how can you fulfil this? You can't. Every part of my walk in the Lord was I bought a house with a room big enough to have a house meeting in. I bought a house close enough that I could drive to the meeting. At no point did we ever move away from the vital parts of fellowship and the Lord's work it paid off for us and it's paid off for so many people here as well. That's how you think when you're a servant of the Lord and that's how God wants you to think. So to summarise, the culture wars are won by doing what God says. God wants us to be a servant people. He'll bless us more than we could ever give up. He's made that promise physically and spiritually. What more could we want? If we ask the Lord to open our heart and mind to wisdom and prayer, we too can move very comfortably into that arena or we can keep extending who we are into bigger and better things. This world needs people with the light on. Now, it's dark and so many people don't know the truth. And all those who knew the truth said, Amen. I'll just leave it there. Thank you.